Hey, good afternoon, y'all. Hope everybody's having a good day. Welcome aboard. And uh, something I need to do here, and that is give a special shout out to Steve over at Harniel Media. Uh, for those of you who have tried to go to my website over the past couple of months, there have been um, intermittent issues. Uh, sometimes it's not been accessible. Sometimes it has been just fine. Other times it may have sent you off somewhere that you didn't want to go. Um, Steve is the sponsor of MarkLindsayCNC.com, my website. And behind the scenes, he has been working his tail off, I mean, for a couple of months, trying to get this sorted out. And as it turns out, it was a uh, issue with the server software um, that was causing all the problems. So it is back up. It is running. I'm doing some updates and getting more information up there. And I just wanted to say thank you to Steve for literally working for a couple of months to get this straightened out. Um if you're looking to establish or improve your web presence and you are looking at a website, I would wholeheartedly recommend Harniel Media. And there's a link to Harniel Media in every video on my channel. Uh, again, he's the sponsor of MarkLindsayCNC.com. And thank you, Steve, for all of your efforts. You are greatly, greatly appreciated. And I don't mention you nearly as much as I should. So, um, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, this morning's video was on importing an STL file and, uh, need to make a little correction here. Uh, not trying to call anybody out or anything, but, um, I'm glad you got something out of the video this morning, John, but it's importing STLs in version 11 and higher. Uh, I triple checked to make sure of that because I couldn't remember exactly when they started that. Was it, um, was it 10.5? Was it 10.0? They started this new interface in version 11.0. So it was, uh, a big surprise to me. And I didn't realize it until I went to import an STL file. And it was uh, kind of a little bit confusing at first because, first of all, the form was a lot smaller. And then second, the um, it was split into two different screens. And I didn't understand what that um, what those three rings for importation were all about. So, got that straightened out in my brain, got everything taken care of, and then just started working with it and kept going and kept going and then realized, wait, this is much, much easier than the old one. The old one had, it had a lot of confusing information there that I don't think was really needed. And those um, orbit rings for making the fine adjustments on how you place the STL within the material made things a lot easier. And um, so I had planned on making this video for quite a while. It just other things took precedence and I finally got to it. So right now I'm on the hunt. Um, don't quote me on this. It may not happen. I'm hoping it'll happen. But right now I'm on the hunt through all of my files uh, to find a good file that I can use uh, for a video to do a uh, import for a two-sided STL file. So I I'm on the hunt for that. We will see what happens. Uh, and hopefully my uh, next video will be just that. It will be putting uh, importing a double-sided STL file into vCarve and Aspire. So, uh, and then from there, who knows? So if you have any questions about today's uh, video or any other video, go ahead, feel free to go ahead and put them in the, uh, in the uh, comment section. And um, 
Uh, let's see. I see a little comment right here. Dwayne Ruthig, thanks for the comments about the model plane versus the zero level. Yeah. Um, I don't, I really don't know why they did that. And I mentioned that in the video, uh, in that form, for some reason, they called the modeling plane, the zero plane, and it's not a zero plane. Don't confuse that with adding a zero plane to the, uh, component tree within the model tab modeling tab. Cause it's not the same. Just me personally, that should say modeling plane. Um, and I pointed that out so that folks didn't get confused as to what it was supposed to be. Um, because it could be very easily confused with a zero plane, but, uh, I can see kind of why they said it that way. Cause that does establish your zero, but it is the modeling plane that the whole model is going to be built up from. So, Okay, let's see here. Uh, we have a couple of questions, and if you have any others, feel free to put them over here in the chat, and we'll get to them. Uh, Teaspoon20 wants to know, what's some good sources for free SDL files? And that is a seriously loaded question because there are hundreds of thousands of free STL files out there it depends on what you want. I, uh, you know, if you're looking for architectural stuff, if you're looking for decorative stuff, if you're looking for structural, uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, I mean, you can literally get buried in alternatives out there. So my advice on that would be to number one, have a project in mind and then search for that project rather than just looking for a catalog of uh, 3D files, because you can go to Thingiverse right now and spend the rest of the summer going through Thingiverse and just looking at STL files. And that's just one website. So I my best suggestion would be to decide on a project you want and then start looking for files or designs or ideas that will help you in the pursuit of that specific project. It's kind of like fonts. People ask, well, where can I go to get fonts? Well, what kind of fonts do you want? Because there are hundreds of thousands of them out there. And it's real easy to load up your database with fonts that you'll never use. And I say that as a guy with 1,400 fonts on his computer. I know what I'm talking about because I don't use 90% of them. So uh, I, for things like that, I download as needed or I come up with my own. So, um, you know, it's a seriously loaded question, but I would wait until you have a project in mind, then do your search with that project in mind. So as for uh, a, a website to give you, it's, I, I really, you know, um, like I said, you can start with Thingiverse and then run the gamut from there. But do know, like, Thingiverse is, um, Thingiverse is, it's geared more towards um, 3D printing than it is CNC. Now, having said that, a good 75%, probably more, of the files over there can be used on a CNC router. If you know what you're doing and you slice it right and place it right. And in fact, I'm kind of looking for a few things over there uh, for a uh, two-sided uh, STL import. But I have to talk with the person who created the file, make sure it's okay to use it in a video because in the wonderful world of business, that's, that's considered commercial use. So what can you say? <laughs> But uh, we'll get it. We'll figure it out. It's, you know, it's all fun and games. Okay, Norm Peterson asks another loaded question. What problem do, what problem? Paging Dr. Freud. Uh, what program do people find best for convert, converting a JPEG to an STL? Um, that is also hard to um, to answer simply because Everybody's definition of best 
is different. I mean, um, Aspire works well. Uh, if you have uh, followed Michael Mazalik, and by all means, you should. Uh, in fact, I'll link his uh, channel in the description of this video as soon as we're done, for those of you who haven't. Um, uh, write myself a note. There we go. I'll link his channel in the description as soon as we're done live here. He did a series on uh, taking a JPEG image and creating a 3D model from that. And in Aspire, you can export that as an STL file. Um, but other people have used things like Blender or, um, let's see, um, ZBrush or uh, even Rhino. I mean, they run the gamut. It just depends on what you're attempting to do. And none of it, I will say this, unless you're experienced with it, none of it is super easy. It's pretty, there's a learning curve as well. I guess what I'm trying to say. And depending upon the software you're trying to use, that curve can be as steep or as flat as you decide to make it. I mean, it, it, you're going to have to work with it, learn the software and um, learn the controls no matter which program you use. So I, I don't know, it's difficult to say if you're trying to take a photo of a person and create a 3D relief that will um, accurately portray that person. There are some folks who are wizards with doing that in Inspire. There are others who are wizards with doing that in ZBrush or a combination of the two. So I don't know that there is any one best. It's kind of like saying, what's the best car? Yeah, there are so many variables and so many different criteria. They all have pluses. They all have minuses. Um, there are a lot of people that swear by Carfco Maker Plus. But I, I've i never worked with it, so I couldn't say yes, no, or maybe. Now, others may have other opinions. So feel free to throw your opinion in there if you use a uh, 3D software to uh, convert a JPEG image. But there's always going to be a lot of getting in. You're, you're attempting to take a flat 2D photo and extrude height out of all of those things. So there's going to be a lot of work involved in it. And that's why it costs so much to have done. So, I mean, it's, it's something that a lot of people specialize in simply because it takes so much time to do. It really does. So... Let's see here. Um, Peter Van Vliet says, when doing non-cursive text, okay, do you still convert to curves or do you leave it? And when you resize text, do you prefer using the draw text tool or set size tool? Okay, for the uh, second half, uh, the second question first. When I'm resizing text, Generally speaking, I don't go back to the draw text tool. I go into set size. If I indeed do that, 99 times out of 100, I'll just click it, give it a second, click it again to go into move and transform mode, and I'll drag it to what looks right. Uh, so that may be some odd, weird size. It just needs to be in proportion to whatever it is I'm working with. If it's going underneath a, a V carving or a 3D model or something like that, um, I'll just size it until it looks good to me. You know, um, I generally do it that way. There are times I need it to be a specific size. And in that case, I'll use the set size tool. Um, more often than not, if I'm not using a script font, uh, or a cursive text, like you're talking about, um, more, it, it depends on what the font is. As you use fonts and get used to working with certain fonts a lot, 
you start to know their idiosyncrasies. And some of them I will convert to curves so I can go in and reduce the number of points in the, in the text. But others, I know that's a waste of time, especially if it's a block text, a real square blocky text like Arial Black. There aren't a lot of curves and there aren't a lot of points. But you get into something like uh, Phoenician, then there's a lot of points and a lot of, uh, a lot of line segments in there because there's a lot of angles. So I will convert those to curves. So it, 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 I'm going to have to give the answer that people don't like to hear. It depends. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, that's kind of font specific. Um, it, uh, what I'll do is I can go in, you can open up convert to curves and then preview it and see, is that going to really reduce the number of points? And if it doesn't, you can always undo that convert to curves. You know, control Z is your friend. Anything that you do can be undone unless you save it, close it, and then come back. Then it's too late. So, um, Ayal Peleg is saying Hebrew fonts that are suitable for C and C. That is a, that's a subject that, is going to have to be solved by a native speaker um, because I don't speak the language. I don't know the alphabet. I don't know anything at all about it. So I wouldn't even begin to know where to look for it. And a lot of it is the same thing with some of the Asian languages in that it's hard to find certain fonts that will work. And what it's going to take is an artist in that community to come up with those fonts. I mean, that's the only thing I know to say. And it's just, it's down to my ignorance because I don't speak the language and I, you know, I don't speak Russian or Ukrainian. So I have no idea about Cyrillic alphabets either. So, um, and I wouldn't even know where to begin to look. Uh, but it is, you are not the first person, I all that has mentioned that. And uh, you're also not the first person who has mentioned the uh, being able to enter text from right to left instead of left to right. Um, the software companies just need to catch up on that. So um, some of the software companies and some of the font creators have caught up with the vertical writing, but not with the uh, right to left. So, uh, yeah, I didn't. I know you didn't ex exactly expect an answer. I, I understand that. By the way, Cyrillic is easier to find, and it's simply because more people speak and write in that language. I mean, that's it, it's not saying anything good or bad about any any of them. But you have just so many more people that speak the language and use that alphabet. So, see, Peter Van Bleet says, what are your usual V-bit diameters? Depends on what I'm doing. I have uh, diameters that run anywhere from, let's see, half-inch diameter to... Um, See, I think my smallest is one eighth inch diameter. Um, my go-to bit is a, um, see, I don't have it here. No, I don't have that bit here. My go-to bit is, believe it or not, a Bosch uh, 90 degree V bit that happens to have a five eighths of an inch diameter. And let's see what five eighths of an inch is here. Uh, five inches in millimeters. That is uh, about a 15.875 millimeter diameter. Um, that's my go-to. Uh, and I'll preview it using that bit. And if I don't like the depth, if I think it needs to be a little bit better, 
This one I do have right here. I have a CMT 60 degree V bit. Uh, it's the CMT, what's it called? Uh, laser point. And it's a carbide, carbide Z3 quarter inch shank, 60 degree. Yeah, CMT laser bit, laser point bit. Um, I like that bit a lot. Uh, but it's got, let's see, what's the diameter on it? It is, cutting diameter is half inch. So a little bit over 12 millimeters. So, uh, but I have them all the way down to an eighth of an inch. And um, I, that's the 15 degree V bit it uh, for uh, that I'm going to be using for epoxy inlays. I just haven't gotten to that point yet. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Jack Matt wants to know what are the advantage of using a half inch bit instead of a standard quarter inch shank bits uh much stronger um of course i took it way over there now so i can't show it to you i have a uh surfacing bit a um a mana tool it's one of the three wing surfacing bits that uh, rob sandstrom and um shane peters recommend and it has the three wings with the replaceable carbide inserts. It's got a quarter inch shank. It also has a two inch cut diameter. This is the bit that I've been using as a surfacing bit. That is uh, carbide tip, two flute. And it's uh, a Freud surfacing bit. Or actually they call it a straight mortising bit. But look how tiny that shank is. I have to... Not necessarily baby this, but I have to be more gentle in cutting with this bit because that's a large bit on a small shank. So I can't push this bit as hard as I could a bit with a half inch shank. Um, so it comes down to strength, number one. Number two, if you're talking about just a, uh, say, a quarter inch end mill versus a half inch end mill, if you can get the half inch end mill, if it's if it's not too big to fit into the area that you're trying to cut, almost always the half inch shank has longer flutes, so they will cut deeper. So if you're trying to cut through one inch material, your quarter inch end mill may or may not have enough flute, cutting flute, to actually do the job, whereas a, a half inch bit certainly will. Uh, I think my, I, I don't have them within reach, um, but my half inch bit, I believe has an uh, inch and a half of, uh, maybe it's more, but I believe it's inch and a half of uh, cutting flute length on it. So those are just a couple of advantages and they remove more material, material, excuse me. They remove more material per, pa per pass. I don't know why I got the hiccups all of a sudden. But that's what happens when you go live. So those are a couple of advantages. Um, but the biggest con, the biggest disadvantage to half-inch tools is, well, there's two of them. Price, because they are expensive. Um, and the other is the ability to fit in routers for those people who are using a router as you have something like a uh, the makita routers or some of the the dewalt 611 something like that um, either you can't get a half inch collet for it or they are hard to find or they're expensive if you do find them so and dewalt 611 may have a half inch collet i'm not sure but um, you have to have a pretty stout router to be able to spin that because that's a lot of mass. So, but uh, those are the main advantages and disadvantages of half inch bits. But you'd be surprised. Those things are pricey, pricey, pricey. So, okay. Let's see, Mary Rebecca Carlson says, I'm getting ready to cut out a round cutting board. Wondered if it's best to leave the datum in the middle of the material 
or doesn't matter. Yes, there we go. Doesn't matter. Um, how did you, okay. You're getting ready to cut it out. Um, it depends on how you set it up in the software. If you've set it up with your X, Y datum in the center, use that. Don't try to change it. Um, it, the difference between setting the X, Y datum in a center and setting it to a corner is pretty subjective. Now you're going to be cutting it out. Um, if it's, you're cutting it out of a square or rectangular piece of material, I'll tell you, it doesn't matter if it's already round and you're doing some engraving, go for the center, go for the center. Um, because well, there is no corner. But uh, some folks prefer to set their XY datum to the center all the time. I do on certain occasions, but I use a three-way touch plate that sets my X and Y zero as well as my Z zero. So I usually go for the bottom left corner. But it, it all things being equal, it really doesn't matter. It's pretty subjective. So... You know, um, I hope that answers that. Uh, basically put, if it's already round, I would go for the center. If it's not round, if it's rectangular, it doesn't matter. It's your choice. Just pick one and stick with it all the way through. So, see, Russell Faraday says, small shank, long bits suffer more deflection. True. Uh, that's my reason to like them. That is true. And uh, a lot of... There are a lot of tools you can't get certain profiles with quarter inch shanks, uh, especially when you're talking about some form tools like OG bits or um, panel bits for raised panels or uh, various edge profiles, what have you. Some of them don't come in quarter inch because the mass of the tool is too much for quarter inch. It would just deflect way too much. Um, half inch bits have a longer, like I say, they have a longer cutting flute length and with that stiffer, larger diameter, it is, uh, it's, it's much stronger, much stouter. You're going to get less, uh, vibration. You're going to get less, uh, chatter and, um, they're just all in all more rigid, but again, you pay the price for them. So, I mean, I have a half inch ball nose bit that was $80. So, you know, they're, they're not cheap. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. Is there, are there any other questions out here? I'm not seeing any. So if you have any, boy, we've only been on for a half an hour. Excuse me. Okay, Peter Van Vliet says, do you have any handy G-code utility files you've made? For example, setting X, Y, 0 to a specific spot after powering up the CNC. Um, no, I don't, but I am going to be getting into that. Now, there is one exception to that rule. Um, normally, my attitude is I don't save G-code. I don't save it at all. Um, mainly because I know my luck. If I get complacent with using a certain piece of G code and something changes, I will forget that change and try to use that G code on something else and end up spoiling the project. It's happened to me already once. And that's what kind of drove that into me. With I create a project, let's take uh, that T shelf that I made not too long ago. I made that specifically for that half inch walnut material that I have. If I decided to come along later on and use some three quarter inch material, I need to go into Aspire, readjust my material sizes and go in and do any changes to that file to accommodate the thicker material, then save new G-code. 
I it's easy for me to go ahead and go through the file, save new G code and run that G code for every project I, that I, that way I don't make a mistake and use the wrong G code. So as soon as I'm done with the project, I delete that G code. It's gone. I can't go back to it. There is one exception to that rule. And that is my keyhole bit G code. I created the G code specifically for, I got it right here. I created that G code specifically for this keyhole bit because it's based on the height of this cutter here, the diameter of the keyhole slot, and the depth of cut. And I created a 1G code file that will cut a three quarter inch tall vertical slot and another that will cut a inch and a half wide horizontal slot both of them with the xy datum set to the center of that slot so what i'll do is i'll figure out where i want to put my keyholes mount the material mark those spots where i want to put the center of those keyholes position my keyhole bit over that XY datum, zero it to the surface of the material, then I'll load that G code and I'll run that G code. I have saved that because that's not going to change. The G code limits how deep that uh, bit's going to cut, move in the correct position, come back, and then lift out. So that's the only exception to that rule. That's the only G code that I've saved. So. Ah, uh, let's see here. Uh, Mr. Bunton says, I sometimes use a framing square on the outside of a round piece to make a corner and use this touch block. Good point. Good point. I, I, I hadn't thought of that. Now, I know some people use a fence system. Like if you watched Rob Sandstrom's, uh, his most recent series on creating the epoxy inlay, uh, he uses a fence system to position his work material in exactly the same spot every time because he'll surface it, make the first carving, take the material off, take it in the house, do an epoxy pour, bring it out, put it back in that same location. So he uses that fence system to make sure it's absolutely perfect. You could do the same thing with a round piece of material. You can set up a fence system and then use a corner block there. But, um, you know, generally speaking, without going through all of that, it's also just as easy to go ahead and mark an X in the center of your uh, material and then uh, set your X, Y there. So, but yeah, your point is well taken. So let's see here. Um, Russell Faraday says new G code to implement the strategy changes that I learned the first time I cut it. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I, the first time you do something, you're going to school. By the time you get to your third or fourth, you're getting better at it. And by the time you're at your 10th or 12th, you're pretty competent. And by the time you get to your 50th, you're an expert. You're the teacher. Well, how many of us do the same thing repeatedly over and over and over and over? And I find for sure that every time I run a project on the CNC, there is something that I wish I would have done differently. And if I remember, I will go back to that file and make those quick changes. Now, that's especially true if I'm uh, going to be uh, putting the file up on my website or something like that. I have to make those changes, uh, which is why I don't put many files up on my website at all. I, I'm not a, I want to make this file and sell it kind of guy. I'm not so just, nah. But um, we all learn a little bit of uh, uh, sometimes hard lessons, sometimes easy lessons every time we do the, uh, 
every time we we do a project so but yeah your point is very well taken Let's see, Lewis Denton says, is there any preference of image formats for CNC? Are some better than others for specific things you're trying to do? Image formats. Um, are you talking about for uh, like a bitmap trace or something of that nature? Um, or are you talking about trying to do... Um, uh, create a uh, 3D model based on a photograph? Uh, I have, I haven't found any limitations as far as images are concerned when importing into uh, VCarve or Aspire, either one. Um, some people prefer PNG files over JPEG files, but I have imported, you know, just about all of them that they'll import and haven't really found an issue. The number one thing that I do is I try to find the largest image at the best resolution possible because that's going to do more to determine how good of a bitmap trace you get than the file format. You know, I'm not going to say the file formats are equal because they're not, but I find that to be less of a factor than the resolution of the image I'm trying to trace or I'm trying to, uh, create something from so i hope that answered that um uh let's see hosam kiali says good evening do you have a way to make a spire check clamp placement so i could use it as templates for repeat same projects in the same clamping places uh not automatically. Um, you can set up, you can draw circles and corners for where you're going to put screws to make sure that your bit is not going to interfere with that screw placement. Um, but to make it automatically avoid clamps, I can't think of a way really to do that. But that is one of those areas where setting XY datum to the center of a project can be a benefit. Um, I'll give you an example. If you have a fixture that is going to clamp a piece at each end and you're going to be carving in the center in between those clamps, there's no need for you to set your XY datum way down at the bottom left corner. You can put your XY datum in the center, then clamp your material at both ends in that fixture, bring your gantry forward, set your XY zero, then carve your first piece, lift up those clamps, take them out, put the next piece in, clamp it down again, cycle start and just cut the same thing over and over again that way aspire doesn't have to look for clamps you're positioning your clamps well within the range of the, to where you'll securely hold the material but far enough away from the bit that it won't interfere uh but a way for it to check for clamp placement you would have to draw that in yourself and then remember where that clamp placement is you know maybe take a, a screenshot with you so that you could see where that uh, clamp placement was but not to automatically do it no so uh let's see blake willemson uh channel supporter says hey mark do you, you have you done a video on using the texturing toolpath in Vectric? Yes, I have done two. Uh, the texturing toolpath and create a uh, bitmap texture. I've done both. Uh, just writing myself. Okay, wrote myself a note. I will post a link to the texturing toolpath video in the description of this video as soon as we're finished. Uh, live here, but yes, I have. And that, 
I got to tell you, I think the texturing toolpath is an underused uh, resource. It eliminates just about all of any tooling marks that may be left by uh, a pocket if you're leaving raised text or a raised area to vCarve text into. It will just eliminate all of it. So I think it's really under, underused. But Okay, let's see here. Um, uh, John Thompson says on a 3D model, is the properties wrench the icon to set the model height? Yes. Say if you're using three quarter inch wood and only cut it to say one quarter inch deep. Yes, that is the, uh, that is where you set it. You can set the base height and you can set the model thickness. Yeah, that is the properties wrench. So. Uh, let's see. Um, Peter Van Vliet says I do the same for all non-project files, two keyhole files, one for the center datum X, Y, zero location. Another one for resetting X, Y, zero to mounted laser head has a fixed offset from the router Z location. Okay. And see, now I don't have a laser or anything else mounted on the CNC. The only thing that's mounted on the CNC is the router and the dust collector hose. So. You know, I, I don't have any of those things. Now, if I had a laser that was offset from the center point of my router or spindle, then yes, I that is uh, something that you could do with um, with uh, within your design software. But that is also something that's a macro you can put into your control software if you're using, say, Mach 3 or Mach 4. You can set up a macro with an offset so that when you load the G code, it knows that you're, you pick that macro with that G command, say G54, for example. Um, it knows to offset a certain amount because you're using the laser and not the uh, spindle or router. So, um, but not all control software will do that. Whoa, I got a cat fight going on. <laughs> wow, it was a cat fight outside. Man, well, everybody needs a hobby. So do the cats. <laughs> uh, Peter says, Vectric doesn't have an offset in the laser tool paths. I wish it did so I could just put the offset there. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, they don't have an offset for the laser, but you can use an offset in uh, job setup. So that's where a lot of people will put that offset is in job setup. So, okay. Uh, are there any more questions or did I miss any here? Um, let's see. Um Okay, yeah, Hossam, uh, thanks. Good idea. We'll make a drawing for the clamps inside it. Yeah, and and I'm going to be doing a bunch of fixturing and jig creation videos in the future. Um, things are kind of in upheaval right now, right specifically now. I have a lot of people asking me, when are you going to get back on that epoxy inlay and finish that pirate? I'm kind of dragging my feet on it, but you'll see why. Uh, more will be revealed. Give me about three weeks. Okay. More will be revealed. <laughs> so um, it's a case of um, I'm trying to get everything done at once, but I I'm waiting on things and that complicates issues, you know? So, uh, we'll get to it. Believe me. Uh, let's see here. Um, Peter Van Vliet says for a combined project routing and laser, the single job setup offset definition doesn't fly. Unfortunately. Yeah. I don't have the laser module because I don't have a laser. I would love to get my hands on it because from what I've seen of the well, what's new in Vectric videos, that laser module, the ability to, the example they used was, I believe, a tiger. Maybe it was a lion. 
but they 3D carved that head of that big cat, whichever it was, and then went back with the laser and shadowed and highlighted certain things with that laser. And that was awesome. I looked at that and I was, holy cow, I want to do that. Got to get a laser mark. Then you got to get the laser module. And I'm waiting to wait right now. But that's that will come. So you're saying that the single job setup offset definition doesn't work with that. Okay. So that's another complication to explore. Uh, and John, that um, it right there explains why I really can't expound on the offset feature because I don't have anything to apply it to. So I don't have any experience with it. I haven't needed it. Uh, when I'm like, if I'm using a fixture, I will set my XY datum to the center and just, you know, now having said that, if I'm engraving, I don't have any here and I don't have any images of it and it's gone now. I used to make little oval plaques for my wife's favorite yarn shop and they basically, yeah, more or less had her, uh, uh, yarn shop information on the back of it and i would these were made of aromatic cedar and i would make a bunch of them and take them in and uh she would buy them from me and then she would sell them to customers for that i made a fixture that used two cheap harbor freight toggle clamps that i could cut out little ovals out of a uh, quarter inch thick aromatic cedar and drop one of those ovals in this fixture clamp clamp I would set my X, Y datum to the center of that oval one time. Then I could load the G code, run that first one. When it was done, move the gantry out of the way, lift those toggle clamps, take one out, throw a blank in, clamp it down, and just hit cycle start, and it would automatically come back to zero and carve the next one. And then when it was done, move the gantry out of the way, flip it open, take that one out, throw the next one in, clamp it down. I am going to be doing another fixture similar to that because I have discovered that about 75% of the projects that I do, I use a specific size of material, which is basically a... a I buy them, they're called select pine panels. And it is um, kiln dried furniture grade pine that I get from my hardwood supplier. They're at the uh, eight to 10% that we need for woodworking. And it's basically a one by 12. It's four quarter, three quarter inch thick um, by about, 11 wide and I cut them into 16 inch lengths and clamp it down. And that's what I make most of the signs that I make for people out of. Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense to keep screwing it down to the spoil board when I can just make one fixture that'll clamp down a piece, set my X, Y, datum in one one time run the project unclamp it take it out and throw the next blank in clamp it down and go so the offset feature i don't use simply because that's how i do everything i could set up an offset to where it knows it needs to go into this you know area and then start carving over here you know, uh, it's, to me, it's an overcomplication. So, uh, let's see. Lewis Denton says, have hit clamps when the bit is descending as it travels to the starting point. Yeah. Did you show how to travel to starting point and then descend? Uh, that is set up with your home position and your uh, safe Z. There is nothing you can do about that it will start descending as it leaves that home position 
and goes to the safe Z position, your Z1 height. If you don't want it to descend, set your safe Z height, Z1, in material setup. And let me bring it up. I will show it again here. Oh, we're not. We StreamYard has decided we are not going to. Oh, come on. Okay. I'll have to share my screen manually. And here we go. All right. Um, again, that's over here in the toolpath tab. Go into set on material setup. And come down here, the rapid Z gap above material. Uh, and down here is the Z gap above material in the home position. If you have a height set here and you want to make sure it does not descend on the way out there, set this height to the same height you have down here. Then it will move over at the same height and then plunge down. But do know that when it's done cutting in one area and lifts out, it's going to move up to that height before it moves. So if it's cutting out one, V-carving one letter and lift up, it's going to lift up to this height and then move over to the next letter and plunge. So you will increase machine time because it's lifting up further out of the, uh, out of the cut that it just completed. But that's where you would set that. Without setting these to the same height, it's going to start at X0, Y0, at point, in my case, point 0.8 above the material, and then travel down to point 0.2 when it gets to that first area that it wants to cut. So, so that's how to take care of that. <laughs> okay, let's see, we're sitting at about three minutes before the end. Uh, we're going to try to get to this question, and this will have to be the last one. I'm very sorry. Um, Ian Paling says, cutting a crescent moon for a customer one inch high in the middle at its highest, down its spine, then down to zero on sides. As a model or using create shape profile, 2D profile, there is a ledge at its base. Okay. Uh, I assume you're using a spire. If not, uh, well, it doesn't matter if it's uh, a spire or V-carve. For that ledge at its base, two things. Um, go into, let me share again here. Hold on. Now, please understand I don't have a model loaded. Let me go back over here. When you are in the uh, modeling tab, you'll click on the wrench, select that model. Click on the wrench, you can adjust the base height. That is probably what that ledge is. If that's not the ledge, if that's not the ledge you're talking about, then what you'll want to do is in your 3D roughing and 3D finishing toolpath, you will want to use a boundary offset that is equal to the diameter of the bit you're using. So in this case, I'm, I would be using a one eighth inch ball nose. I would put a boundary offset of one eighth of an inch right there. That forces the bit to come down to the edge and then go outward just slightly that eighth of an inch, then come back and make the next pass and do the same thing on the next side, go out beyond the model about an eighth of an inch. Now, unless that will interfere with your pattern and you can't do that, um, that's how another way you could eliminate that issue is setting a boundary offset. Now, personally, I would check that base height first. So that should be, that should be it. Okay. Um, sorry, but we're going to have to, uh, wrap this up. Um, we have... Um, man, right at the top of the hour, uh, for my channel members, uh, and channel supporters, remember to head over to the 
um, community tab. And let me show this on my screen here. Share this. Remember, tomorrow night is the first members only live stream. Head over to my channel homepage and click on the community tab. And there are the links for the members only live streams. Just click on that and you're all set for big time supporters. It's hidden from view. There is the link to be join me on camera. Remember, head over to my channel page, click on the community tab, and there they are. Okay. Uh, tomorrow at 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 Eastern time, we'll kick off the first members only live Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for becoming channel members. Um, everybody else, we will see you next week. If you would like more information on becoming a channel member, you can just look right here for that little join button right there. You click on that. It'll open up a thing that'll give you information about becoming a channel member. Uh, if you're using iOS, if you're on an iPad or you're on an iPhone, you will not see that button. And that's an argument between YouTube and Apple. Look down in the description. You'll find a direct link to be able to get that information. If you're not interested in becoming a channel member, great, terrific. It's 100% up to you. You can cancel or downgrade your membership at any time. I will see everybody next week uh, for an open Q&A. If I did not answer your question, please, please, please bring it next week and we'll try to get to it as quick as we can. Um, other than that, I think that's it. I will get these two links put in the description, the texturing toolpath and the link to Mike Mazalik's uh, YouTube channel, head over there and subscribe to him. He is the guru, I'm telling you. I want to say thank you again to Steve Nealon at Harneo Media for all his hard work on my uh, website over the past couple months. And until next week, go do something cool. Get out in the shop. Have some fun. Or maybe just rest up. It's Sunday. Just take it easy. Have a good one, y'all. See you next week. Thank you very much.